Hi, I'm Bake Adafi, and this is Bible Study Verse by Verse. We're studying through a book of the Bible a verse at a time. This series of lessons is on the book of 1 Corinthians. If you'd open your Bible to the New Testament, to the book of 1 Corinthians, we'll begin in just a moment. First Corinthians is the Bible book we're studying. This is lesson 69, and we're starting with chapter 15 and verse 50. If you'd like to open your Bible there, we'll begin in a moment. We have a free offer of a written Bible study for you entitled The Mercy of God. You can request your copy by emailing me at the address shown at the end of the lesson. Let's begin by reading 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 50. Now, now this I say, brothers, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, neither does corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. Let's pray. Father, we ask you to bless your word to us now, Lord. Thank you for your grace and your mercy extended to us in Christ Jesus. Thank you that you've sent your Holy Spirit into the word to be our comforter and our instructor. Lord, we ask for open minds by your spirit that the truth of your word might penetrate down deep into our souls and our hearts, that we can be acceptable to you in the way that we live because we're in Christ Jesus. In his name, amen. Well, this chapter 15 is about the resurrection from the dead. Um, <clears throat> chapter 15, verse 12, it was uh, uh, Paul preached that Christ rose from the dead. There were people that said there is no resurrection from the dead. And then verse 30, uh, 35, um, people are questioning how possibly, you know, tongue-in-cheek, um, uh, sarcastically, uh, what body would people be raised from if you were raised from the dead? Um, what body do they come? So he answers uh, e all of these objections and we're to the point now uh, where he's making statements about the eternal life that we're looking forward to. And um, his statement in verse 50 is uh, to, to Christians, to brethren, that Flesh and blood does not inherit the kingdom of God or cannot inherit it. So it's not our earthly bodies that we take to heaven with us. Um, we don't go uh, in the body that we're in, that we're occupying now. Um, this is uh, for earth. This is our tabernacle, uh, a tabernacle for God. That's why we glorify God in our bodies. That's why we're careful with what we do. That's why we don't... Um, do things that are going to cause other people to stumble. But this body is not the one that's going to be uh, taken up into heaven. Um, it's, um, it's flesh and blood. It doesn't make it into God's kingdom. It's corruption. It doesn't inherit incorruption. In other words, in order to make it there into heaven, you have to have an incorruptible body. And that happens at the end of the world, at the resurrection. Um, it's no big deal for God to change our corruptible bodies into incorruptible bodies. There's, there are things that happen um, that we can only see as we look at the Lord Jesus about what it's going to be like. I mean, we looked last time at how, you know, the natural laws that we are bound by of, of the creation, he was not bound by, although he did have a physical body and he did eat. And, uh, and he was able to communicate and talk to people. He was taken up into heaven without oxygen, and he passed through walls uh, with no problem and entered into places where uh, it was all sealed up for fear of the Jews. So that's the um, incorruptible body that we're all going to share uh, like Jesus has. And then 51 says, Behold, I show you a mystery. So this is, a, uh, in the scripture, when it talks about a mystery, um, it means something that has not been revealed uh, usually up until the point that it's being talked about. Or if it is revealed, people didn't understand it. They didn't get it. It was, 
it, um, just like the uh, the disciples on the road to Emmaus, their 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 understanding was held. Their eyes were held. They didn't understand who Jesus was as he talked to them until uh, he broke the bread, and and uh, then they got it. And then they uh, he'd vanished out of their sight, and, and they said our hearts burned when he was talking to us. Um, you know, there's um, there's uh, a spiritual reality that is kept back from our normal understanding uh, until the time that God wants to reveal it. So Paul is going to show us a mystery. We're not all going to sleep, but we shall all be changed. So sleep is a euphemism in the scripture. It's a, ni it's a nice way of saying we all aren't going to die. Um, some people will be alive at the return of the Lord Jesus. Their bodies will not die at the time of his return. They will go from um, a corruptible body to an incorruptible body without having to pass through that state of death and, and uh, decay of the body like most of us are going to have to do and people up to the time that I'm speaking to you right now had to do. Um, we shall not all sleep. We're all, we all aren't going to die but we're all going to be changed. So here's how it happens. Verse 52. In a moment in a twinkling of an eye at the last trump. So there's a, t there's a time given for how long this takes. Now I don't know um, I don't know how long it takes for, for, the, for the light from some source to hit a person's eye and for another person who observes this to see that twinkle of the light in that person's eye. I mean it is a fraction of a second. Um, there used to be an old um, comic strip called Brenda Starr and she was a reporter and, and uh, whenever it showed her Somewhere on her there was a light, uh, you know, the, the symbol for light is those, those lines going out. She had, had those because she was like sparkly, you know. I mean, it was just, you know, the way that the, the cartoonist drew her. You know, that's, the, um, that's how quickly that God is going to take our uh, decomposed old dead bodies and change them and give us a new bodies and it's going to happen just that quickly. I mean the creation um, of everything took six days and seventh day God rested. This resurrection and this change is going to be momentary. momentary. It's going to happen quickly. There isn't going to be um, there's going to be no no time that it takes for this reconstitution. I mean this is a God thing. This is God acting as God and doing what he pleases. It happens in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye. And when does it happen? It happens at the last trumpet. So uh, you read about these trumpets. There are seven of them that blow um, in Revelation. And the last one, uh, you know, Jesus is coming on a white horse. He's coming with his armies. Uh, he's coming as a triumphant victor. Um, sin, well, we're, we're going to read about that. Sin is destroyed. Death is destroyed and all people are raised from the dead. The trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. So, um, at that last trumpet, everyone who's ever lived is going to be raised from the dead. Now, some people are going to be raised to eternal life. Some people are going to be raised to eternal death. But we're all going to get these kind of bodies that are going to last forever. You know, like our bodies, um, there's been times in the history of man where, where people's lifespans were very short, maybe 40 years, maybe, maybe less. Some people lived to 120 years, some 80 years. And, you know, in the beginning of creation, people lived, um, Adam lived 930 years, you know. But um, that's just a drop in the bucket compared to the, to the eternity that we're going to have in the new bodies that we get. And for a Christian, your body is going to be like the Lord Jesus's. You're going to be in heaven enjoying Him and, and, and uh, getting to know God better and better each day. And uh, if you're raised uh, to, to eternal death, you're going to be in a place of punishment that was prepared for the devil and his angels. And you will suffer an eternity in that body that, um, that will not die you're going to be there forever. In other words, you don't get any relief 
from the suffering that you have. You continue to suffer and suffer and suffer and it never ends and you're separated from God. I mean, that should scare you into faith in Christ because who wants to spend an eternity separated from God? You don't have any friends there. You can holler all you want. No one's going to come and help you. You're thirsty beyond your imagination. You're being eaten by worms and your body is not going to die. You know, at least, um, you know, people who are tortured by, uh, by terrorists or whatever, you know, at least when they, they have some relief at the end, when they die, they wish for death. I mean, you're going to be in hell wishing that you could get out of it and there, there's going to be no way out. So in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, the last trump, the trump will sound, the dead are going to be raised incorruptible and we're going to be changed. So the we here is people that are alive. So the, the people that are dead are going to be changed and brought back and given that body. The people that are alive are going to then follow them and be changed and get that body and and those who are alive uh, won't have to pass through that uh, pass through death to get there for this corruptible man that means our bodies our bodies are corruptible uh, we have the effects of sin upon us we're headed toward death each one of us must put on incorruption that that means we, when we're we're raised again we get an incorruptible body and this mortal must put on immortality you know incorruption Corruption puts on incorruption. Mortal puts on Im immortality. 54 says, <clears throat> So, when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, at that time, last trumpet, dead are raised, we who are alive are changed. We all get incorruptible bodies. When, when, when that happens, the incorruption, the, the immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying, that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. So, um, death will no longer have a hold on us. We will not be subject to death. Um, we're not going to be sinning anymore, um, and we're not going to have death uh, um, to look forward to or to, to, to dread, you know, as, as, we, as we age. Um, I mean, we're not going to age because we're not going to get old and we're not going to we're not going to die. Time, time is, is ended then. So death is swallowed up in victory. I mean, uh, Christ's victory on the cross uh, was his death, his burial, and his resurrection. He, defeat, he defeated Satan. God's wrath was poured out completely upon him upon that cross. He suffered in our place. If you believe in him, if you've put your faith there, your sins are forgiven because God punished them. And uh, he's the propitiation for our sins. God's wrath is completely poured out. God is satisfied with his sacrifice. And then he rose from the dead in a new body, in an incorruptible body, in a resurrected body, in a glorious body. And we're going to share in that same kind of body that he had. That's what our body is going to be like. And death is swallowed up in victory. Uh, uh, the, the, the death that we face, that we fear, that you know, is a constant, you know, constant reminder to us. As you read the newspaper, you look at the obituaries, people, have, people that are younger than you have died, you know, you know it's going to happen to you, but there's going to be victory over death. Uh, o death, verse 55 says, where is your sting? O grave, where is your victory? So let's look at John chapter 5 and verse 25. John chapter 5, <clears throat> verse 25 says, Verily, verily, I say to you, the hour is coming, and now is, when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God, and they that hear shall live. So, um, dead people hear the voice of the Son of God. So, there's really two instances of this. The first is, um, well, 26 of that chapter says, For as the Father has life in himself, so has he given the Son to have life in, in, in himself. So having life is having the Lord Jesus Christ. And when you hear the voice of the Son of God, that means hearing isn't just, um, you know, in one ear and out the other, or it bounces off your skull. It means you've, you've taken it to heart. You've taken it into your soul. You understand what he's saying to you. Hearing his voice is life. Having Jesus is life. Um, 
you can, um, I mean, our eternal life begins when we hear the gospel message and we receive it. We believe it. We're born of God then and um, we're changed. We, um, we pass from death to life. Um, those that hear that voice are going to live. And then at the end of the world, when he comes back, same thing. He's going to speak. The trumpet's going to sound. All that are in the graves are going to come forth. And um, we who have believed in him are going to come forth to eternal life. They that shall hear shall live. Okay, now turn to 1 Thessalonians 4.13. It says there, 1 Thessalonians 4.13, <clears throat> But I would not have you ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep. So, uh, the he, Paul is answering a question here to the Thessalonians about they're worried about people who were believers but they've died and they're worried about what's going to happen to them. So those uh, asleep then is another euphemism for, for, for death. Um, those concerning those which have died that, that, that you sorrow not. In other words, don't sorrow over these people who, who have died who have had faith in Christ even as others which have no hope. Don't sorrow like people who have no hope of a resurrection. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, if you believe that, even so, them also which sleep in Jesus, which have died in Jesus, in other words, you've died in faith. You've died in forgiveness of sins. You've had faith in Christ. Your sins are forgiven. Even those which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. Those people are coming back at the end of the world. They're coming back with the Lord Jesus. They're going to get their new bodies also. For we say this unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent, that's a King James word that means proceed, or come before those which are asleep. So the people that have died and gone to heaven have died and their sins are forgiven. Those people are coming back with Jesus and they get their new bodies first. There's an order to this thing. Um, those of us who are alive when he comes back, if it's someone who hears this or, I don't know, we never know when he's coming. Maybe it's going to be me. Maybe I'll be alive when he comes back. When he comes back, we will get our bodies, but we get them second to the people that have already died. So uh, 16 says, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God. That's that last trumpet. That's the voice of the archangel. The dead in Christ shall rise first. They go first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. So <clears throat> the dead rise first. Those people who are alive, who have not died, are then caught up to meet the Lord in the air, and um, so we're ever going to be with the Lord. So, I mean, that's not that's going to be when we get the new bodies. We're not going to need oxygen, you know. We're going to have uh, bodies like the Lord Jesus had. It's not, we're not going to be under the constraints of uh, the created order of the way things uh, the way things work. What we call nature now, or or uh, what science is able to observe about, you know. How many times do you drop an apple off a table and it falls to the ground? Well, every time. You know, it's repeatable. It's, um, we know that that's the way it's going to happen. We don't have to keep doing it because it happens every time. Well, those laws are suspended in, in eternity. They don't apply to us anymore because they don't apply to the Lord Jesus and we have a body that's like His. So He's coming back with a shout, the ar voice of the archangel, the trumpet of God, the dead in Christ. Um, are going to rise first and then the people that are alive are also going to be raised up and get um, a, a new body then. So back in uh, 1 Corinthians uh, 15 <clears throat> um, says death is swallowed up in victory verse 54 and O death where is your sting O grave where is your victory and the sting of death, verse 56, is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. So let's untangle this a little bit. Um, when, when you sin, <clears throat> it produces death. 
Sin, death is the, is the product of sin. Um, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. The wages of sin is death. God's going to pay you off for what you've done. By sinning, you earn death. And the, the sin that you commit makes death hurt. If you could remove sin from your death, then it wouldn't be a bad thing. So when a Christian dies, that sting is taken away. When we die, it's, you know, you hear it sometimes at funerals, it's a promotion. We're going to heaven. We're going to be in the presence of the Lord. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. We get an immediate promotion into the presence of God without the sting of death because we have no sin. Our sin is forgiven in Christ. And it's not because we did anything. It's not because of our good works. It's because of who He is and God's punishment of Him in our place. So that sting of death, that sin, uh, for unbelievers, they bear their sin, and so death hurts them. Death is the thing that brings them into great misery and great suffering. The, uh, <clears throat> the rich man in the story of rich man and Lazarus is in, in torment. He's lifting up his eyes and he's talking to Abraham. He's asking for just a drop of water on his tongue. He's, he's in torment in the flames. Uh, he is trying to do anything to get out of them, wiggling around, and nothing is going to relieve his suffering. It's that sting. It's going to hurt him. And the strength of sin is the law. So God has given us his law in order to show us what sin is. I mean, um, that's the reason the law was given. It's a schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. You understand your sin when you understand what God says, you sh how you should live, how you should behave. For instance, don't lie. If you lie, you've broken one of God's commandments, you've sinned, and you're headed to hell for your sin. Only takes one sin to put you in hell. Sinners don't make it to heaven. Only forgiven sinners make it to heaven. Only people who have had their sin removed get to heaven. If you go into your grave bearing your sin, you aren't going to where God is. You're going in the opposite direction. You're headed to hell because you've broken God's law, you've sinned, and the wages of sin is death. You're, you're a dead man walking. You're, you're, headed in, you're headed for death. The strength of sin is the law. All right, so Romans 3, verse 19. 319 says, Now we know that what things soever the law says, it says to them who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped and all the world become guilty before God. So to be under the law means that my approach to God, to being right with God, is going to be, I'm going to have to obey what he says. I'm going to have to be an obedient uh, child of God. I'm going to have to do what he says. And when you approach God that way, you really have no approach at all because you can't do what God says. I mean, if you look at your life and you examine it, go and look at the Ten Commandments, understand what their spiritual meaning is. You don't put God first in your life, ever. You just don't do it. You got to love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. You can't do it. You got to love your neighbor as yourself. You don't do it. You're guilty of sin. And the only way to have that sin removed is by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ because he took the punishment for sin. It's not that God just, you know, forgets our sin. It's that he punished it in Christ and we get to go free from it. So, the law speaks to those who are under the law, who are trying to approach God based upon their works. And it doesn't work. It says that every mouth may be stopped. You aren't going to be able to stand up for, before God and shake your fist in His faith and, and say, well, I did that. I was, you know, I was better than the next guy. I was a good guy. That doesn't hold any water with Him. It's not going to work. 
And all the world may become guilty before God. That's the function of the law. It makes you guilty. It shows you your sin. I mean, when you start to compare yourself to the law, you understand, I'm a sinner. I'm in need of something. I, I don't have anything to recommend myself to God. I have no standing before Him. You know, I'm on... I'm I'm on completely shaky ground. There's no there's no firm foundation for my feet here. For 20 says in Romans 3, therefore by the deeds of the law shall no flesh be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. That's what sin does. I mean that's what the law does. It it gives you um, the knowledge of your sin. That's what that's its function. By the law we understand our sin, and sin is the thing that makes uh, makes our death hurt. It's the sting that makes it hurt. So back in um, 1 Corinthians 15, <clears throat> the sting of death is sin. The strength of sin is the law. The law uh, works to produce a knowledge of sin. It gives us uh, it gives us a standard to live by that we can't we can't live by. So we're sinners, and we're in need of a Savior. Um, 57 says, But thanks be to God, 1 Corinthians 15, which gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Victory over what? Well, victory over our sin. Victory over death. Death and sin have no more victory over me, because I've had faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Do I struggle with sin? Yes. Am I going to die? Yes. But Christ has taken care of that for me. My sins are forgiven. At my death, I go to be with Him. I don't have that sting that death is going to produce in an unbeliever. It's not going to happen to me because I've had faith in Christ. He took the sting for me on the cross. He was punished in my place. Therefore, I get to go free. And then there's a, uh, a conclusion um, to this chapter in verse 58. <clears throat> read, read there in 1 Corinthians 15, 58. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. For as much as you know, your labor is not in vain in the Lord. So the, the conclusion of the matter, the resurrection is going to happen. It's a real thing. It's not a problem for God to raise up bodies. You know, you're foolish if you think that it is. It's going to happen in a moment. It's going to happen in the twinkling of an eye. It's going to happen before you can blink. And all the bodies are going to be raised up at the last trumpet, the voice of the archangel, when Jesus comes back. And if you hear his voice, you're coming back to eternal life. Therefore, how should you live now? Well, you should be steadfast in following after God and being obedient to Him. You should be unmovable. Your feet are firmly planted on the rock of the Lord Jesus. Hold on to your Christianity. Be a good testimony. Be a good witness to those around you, to your family, to your friends, to people you work with, people you go to school with. Always abounding in the work of the Lord. You know, is that said of you? Boy, that, that guy is different. That guy abounds in the work of the Lord. In so much you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 8. <clears throat> now he that plants and he that waters are one, and every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. Labor for the Lord. Work in his vineyard. Um, make it your business to promote his kingdom. For we are laborers together with God, verse 9 says, You are God's husbandry, you are God's building. Are you laboring for, for the Lord? Are you working for Him? Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. Well, let's pray. Father, we just thank You for Your Word, Lord. Help us to be unmovable. Help us to be steadfast. Help us to abound in the work of the Lord. Thank You for what You're going to do in each life. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for watching. In the next lesson, Lesson 70, we'll begin with chapter 16 in verse 1. I hope the Lord blesses you as you study His Word. Here's the description of the free title we're offering. <clears throat> it's title number 10, The Mercy of God. Does God apply His mercy equally to everyone? Is there some mercy that is common to all men and that to all men and some that is reserved for only certain special people? How does God decide 
who receives mercy. It's title number 10, The Mercy of God. <clears throat> You can ask for your free title by name or by number. Or if you have questions or comments about this lesson, please email me at BibleStudyVbyV at gmail.com. And don't forget to subscribe to my channel for more Bible study verse by verse.